I will not be a common man, Peter O'Toole once said. I will stir the smooth sands of monotony. And over an acting career spanning over 50 years, this he surely did. Charismatic, unpredictable, and with those strikingly unconventional good looks. Peter O'Toole was one of cinema's greats. When he was on the screen, you couldn't take your eyes off him. Born in Ireland, but brought up in Leeds, O'Toole decided he had to act after seeing Sir Michael Redgrave performing King Lear. He joined RADA in 1952, at the same time as Albert Finney and Alan Bates, and as one of the theatre's bright young things, built a reputation as a stage actor of unique presence and strength. Small roles in television and film inevitably followed, and then in 1960, at the age of 30, he won the role that would define his career forever. It was, of course, Lawrence of Arabia. And we join O'Toole here in the 1962 program about the film and its making. We wanted to know what his approach had been to Lawrence, which of the many interpretations he'd adopted. He talked with Kenneth Griffiths, the actor, and a friend of O'Toole's on the balcony of his Almeria villa. I hate to define, particularly when I'm working on a character, because I am, um, I find this uh, embalms him, and he becomes an immortel rather than a, a living thing. Um, I came to it by a great deal of research and study, but without any conscious, I mean, I, I'm taken to task a lot about this that I should synthesize, but I won't, and I can't. Um, I'll give an example of how I came to it. Uh, I remember um, sitting in a black tent in a place called El Jaffa, and we were talking about Lawrence to a lot of Arabs. And someone said, oh, Abdi would know better, and they shouted for this man. And in clanked a huge Sudanese gentleman of about 80. And he was a slave, and now a freed slave, whom uh, Awud Abu Tai, who was one of Lawrence's chief warriors, gave to Lawrence to look after him. And he, someone said, what did Lawrence look like? And he pointed at me and said, him. Well, needless to say, we, I grabbed him and we talked and talked and talked. He worked on the picture. He made the coffee, in fact. And uh, one day I was playing a scene and he said, um, I was sort of talking to someone and being rather remote and looking all over the place and he said, a battle, a hero, doesn't look here or there or up or down. He gives someone the plane of his face. I remember two things I'd read. One, Graves told me that Lawrence apparently never looked at anybody. He made a sort of inventory of everyone's clothes. But uh, Kennington, the sculptor who sculpted him a lot and did all the um, illustrations for Seven Pillars, said this remarkable thing which I'd never understood before, which was that Lawrence reminded him of a middleweight boxer. And at that moment, something very important clicked. And uh, I knew exactly what Abdi meant by the plane of his face, which was this. And the eyes didn't travel over the, the clothes, but they were aware of the hands and aware of everything that was going on. And it was at once withdrawn, as a boxer must be, and at the same time, very penetrating. And this one physical thing really clicked, and it made a whole difference to the way I played him. Mm. Now, this is the way I work. I yeah. can't work with a... It's yeah. sort of exact science to mix. Yeah. What about his height, Peter? He was a very short man, and you're a very tall man. Do you make any effort as an actor to think like a small man? No. Uh, no. I've always said when anyone asks me about Lawrence, his inches, I always say it's a question for his tailor, not his interpreter, and that's probably a bit flip. 
But there's nothing I can do. I don't think it's really all that important anyway. And I'm certainly sure he never thought as a small man. Yeah. And I happen to be eight foot five, as you clearly implied. Yeah. And uh, I can't chop off my legs and roam around on bloody stumps, so I really have had to disregard it. What were some of the things that you heard and read that were important to you about deciding you which way you were going to go? Oh, there's so many, many things. Um, I remember speaking to a sheikh in Amman. The first Arab I met who knew him. And uh, I'd given up asking questions like, what was it like, like, how was it? I, I used to try sort of tricky things. And I said to him, did he ever tell jokes? At which point he went into a great stream of Arabic with tears trickling down his face, laughing like a drain. Now, I hadn't the faintest idea what he said, but clearly Lawrence had been very, 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 very funny at one point. And I kept on finding more and more evidence of this. He was a great humorist. Mm. And um, uh, one of them told me about the time that he questioned him for hours about the camel grazing in Piccadilly. And Lawrence gave very solemn replies to all this, whether Oxfordshire was a desert country. And then again, um, on another level, um, his descriptions of some of the things in, in Seven Pillars he did, like the killing of a man, the execution of a man. He had to execute him to keep two tribes from warring with each other and would split up a whole thing and ruin the whole adventure. So he chose, because he had no tribe, and wouldn't offend anybody, to shoot the man. He describes it very coldly in um, Seven Pillars. Now, I met a man who was with him when he did it and um, said that indeed he did do it very coldly, very methodically, and it was rather terrible because the man was down a well and he kept on missing him. And then he went out for a drive in the desert afterwards, he went for a walk, and this man, was very worried about him, went to look for him and found him behind a rock, crouched like a two-year-old baby in the most terrible state of emotion. Now that could color my killing of this man in the film. Of course. I could imply what would happen afterwards mm. Mm. without stating it. Lawrence was a sensation. I woke up one morning to find I was famous, O'Toole once said. I bought a white Rolls Royce and drove down Sunset Boulevard wearing dark specks and a white suit waving like the Queen Mum. Fame and his excesses did indeed fit him just like a suit. But acting was always the priority. The 60s saw him nominated for four leading man Oscars for Lawrence of Arabia, Goodbye Mr. Chips, Beckett and the Lion in Winter. Two films in which he played the same role, Henry II. He was a true international superstar. But despite that status, a chat show would reduce him to jelly, or so he told Michael Parkinson in this appearance from 1972. Evening and welcome. My special guest tonight is unique in that he's the only man I know who's been nominated for an Academy Award and also holds the speed record for drinking beer at the Dirty Duck pub in Dublin. <laughs> that apart, he's one who shares with Olivier and Burton the distinction of being a superstar on stage and screen. He first made his name on stage, notably in Willis Hall's play, The Long, The Short and The Tall. His big break in films came in this movie. The actor and my guest tonight, Peter O'Toole. Delighted to have you with me tonight, double delighted, because in fact you don't do these things very often, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why is that? You get very nervous, don't you, of television? Uh, well, it is nerves. It's, it's total panic. Really? <laughs> I mean, it's not a question of butterflies in the... I've got crows <laughs> <laughs> flapping around. I... Funk. 
Yeah, that's a terror. Good word as any. Yeah. In fact, you did one of these. I was reading in your in your cuttings. You did one of these in America. The last talk show you did, which had rather disastrous results, didn't it? Oh my God, yes. Uh, it was. I don't know the name of the gentleman. It was Johnny Carson. Was it really? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Unfort <laughs> unfortunate man. My name's Mike Parkinson. Hello, oh, no, Mr. Parkinson. <laughs> I don't think I even know my name at the moment. Uh, well, I'd, I'd done that, that ridiculous trip from Japan to New York, which means you leave Japan on Tuesday and get to New York on Monday. <laughs> and this compounded with terror or whatever. I went in, did one of those jobs. Well, incidentally, my wife always thinks that it's called Moon River, that tune. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, said hello, listened to the first question. I answered it. I don't know what I said. Not the faintest idea. I don't know what I'm saying now. <laughs> uh, listened to the second question. I didn't answer it, but I, was, I woke up in a dressing room. My glasses broke. I'd fainted. And I was replaced by a talking dog. <laughs> what really fascinates me, though, is about talking to, to somebody like you, or, or say, somebody like Albert Finney, who was one of your contemporaries at, at RADA. Indeed. And people from this background, this very, very working class background that you came from, is how on earth you ever got the notion to be an actor? Mm. Because, I mean, I knew that, I, and I was brought up, you know, you lived from Hansel, I was brought up near you. And if I'd have said that I was going to be an actor, they'd have thought there was something a bit decidedly wrong about me. A bit pansy. Well, not only was I uh, from Hunslet, I didn't have a, a Yorkshire accent. I also had blonde, curly hair. <laughs> and I was known as Bubbles. <laughs> and that cost me a lot of lumps. <laughs> but uh, well, acting came really... Well, you absorb it, I suppose. There's no immediate process in it, an accumulation of things. I, I left my little warehouse where I'd started work and went to work on a newspaper. The newspaper led to, that sounds very posh, in fact, I was fetching the horse meat for the chief photographer, you know. Horse <laughs> meat? Yes, yes. We used to eat horse meat then, do you remember? <laughs> well, I'm older than you, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, he ate horse meat. Well, maybe he was a, a betting man, I don't know, anyhow. Uh, uh, and that led to, uh, again, night school, my need to improve myself, free tickets to the theatre. Um, I saw Laurel and Hardy, would you believe, oh, on stage, really? yes. On stage? On stage. Oh, marvellous. Flogging around, doing a thing called the old timers. No audience. Nice people. Well, the, the fat one was. <laughs> Didn't like the other one. Uh, you actually met them? Yes. Really? Yes. Well, you went backstage and met them? Yes. Was it, well, I, I was uh, part of the job, you know, it, going around. So as a journalist, yeah. 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 And uh, uh, then bit by bit I got involved in local amateur things. And Oh, by 16 or 17 I was onions deep in, in, in theatre. How did you get the part, in fact, for, uh, for Lawrence? Because that was the thing that really established you as or made you as a film star, wasn't it? How did that come about? Was, um, that, was it chance or good friends or...? <laughs> uh, well, I'd made a film before that uh, uh, called The Day They Robbed the Bank of England. Mm, I remember that. For, uh, with my partner now, Jules Buck, who we've been yes. friends ever since. Uh, in which I, I was, of course, invited to play the Irish tearaway. And I've always carefully avoided playing Irishmen, if I can, could. And I played a guards officer, and a friend of David Lean's, an Indian gentleman, had seen it, rung up David, and said, Lawrence is on the screen. And David went, he t David has told me the story, went and saw it and rang me up and said, uh, you're Lawrence of Arabia. Amazing. Did, did Mr. Spiegel take any convincing? Oh, yeah, what did you say? Oh, dear, yeah. I'd met Mr. Spiegel before. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, once... If the, if the memory's painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's not painful for me. I think it's a little painful for, for Samuel. Uh, I'd asked, he'd asked me to... It was very funny because I went to his office to meet... The phone rang and 
Sam's people, I don't know, Sam Schmeek, I mean, they're all the same to me, Abe and Mike and Spike and I. And uh, would I go and see him? And I went, and I'd just been clearing my dressing room, and I had half a bottle of whiskey in my pocket. And I went in the door and uh, took off the coat, and the bottle of whiskey fell out and smashed on the floor. Now, what the idea of meeting him was, was to replace a rather unreliable actor <laughs> in a film he was making. Uh, and I did some sort of test for him, and I made a joke, alas. <laughs> and he didn't think it was very funny. He nearly died when David said he wanted me to play Lawrence, because he wanted, oh, he'd had everybody, Albert Finney, Marlon Brando. To, I was a, one of a long, long line. That's right, yes, Brando was in fact Indeed. in line. For it, Albert it? was. Yeah. Oh, it's all sorts of fun. Yeah. Let's have a look at it now. Of course, he was a fascinating and controversial figure, Lawrence, wasn't he? What, what conclusions did you come to about him, Peter, when you researched him? If I ever met him, I'd run a hundred miles. Really? Yeah. Why? I don't know. He was probably the most attractive. I mean that, not in its ordinary sense. He, he had a... Don't forget that he was probably the first... 20th century super spy. And he was picked at the age of 16 uh, in Oxford, specifically to be a spy. Um, he wrote his thesis. He got a double first. Uh, riding a bike through all the Crusaders' castles. And he called it Crusaders' Castles. It's mm. published now. Uh, but it was, in fact, his, his history thesis. Uh, at the same time, he was doing maps for the British government of Aqaba, of the, of, um, uh, of the whole of the Jordan Strip, of Maan, Syria, making contacts with the, the Northern Arab leader as a, yeah. a, a student. <coughs> yes. Uh, a couple of things about the, the clip, the, the Lawrence clip you've shown. Uh, do, do you mind me being a little irreverent? Oh, not at all. I uh, think crashing around on the train, I had letters from lip readers because I had no dialogue on, on the, the train at all. And they were all shouting, Orance, Orance, Orance. And I was saying, too kind, most loyal, <laughs> everybody very good and gracious, which was apparently a stock royalty answer. We have a look at, um, at uh, a film you made with Richard Burton, which is a particular favorite of mine, Beckett. And uh, mine. And you will have a, if you can roll it now. You, you like it too, did you? Very much. Well, I think this is one of the best sequences actually in the movie. You never loved me, did you, Thomas? In so far as I was capable of love, yes, I did. Did you start to love God? You mule! Answer a simple question! Yes. I started to love the honor of God. I should never have seen you. It hurts too much. My prince. No! No pity. It's dirty. This is the last time I shall come begging to you. Go back to England. Farewell, my prince. I sail tomorrow. I know that I shall never see you again. How dare you say that to me when I've given you my royal word? Do you take me for a traitor?
Why do you particularly like that, Peter? Well, I'll give you an idea of how we got on, Richard and I. We, we pulled a terrible thing together. We used to, he used to go and watch my rushes, and I would go and watch his. And because neither of us particularly liked seeing ourselves on, on the screen. And uh, uh, we got into an awful scrape because we used to toss up to see what wine we'd have, but, uh, toss up to see who would do what scene and everything. You know. And he, was, he had his hands full at the... Oh, blimey, there's a slip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say his hands full with Elizabeth <laughs> at the time. He was having his problems at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, one day we were, we were hiding in a pub at lunch, and he said, let's do Hamlet. I said, no, no, never. I've done it. So have you. He said, let's do it, he said, again, just to be perverse. I said, oh, no, no, it's the worst play in the world. I won't do it. He said, go on. So oh, I don't know, I had too much red ink or whatever. I, we tossed coins. A, we, we decided that what we'd do would uh, have Olivier and John Gielgud to direct. <laughs> and we tossed up to see who'd get John Gielgud and who would get Larry Olivier. And we tossed up whether who'd get New York and who got London. I got Larry Olivier in London, he got Gielgud in New York. And we did it. Amazing. It's a kind of insanity that goes on. Well, what, what was that like? I mean, it must be daunting. I went up to do the to be or not to be from the bowels one night. And uh, I was to being or not to being. And I could hear slight titters. <laughs> and it was an afternoon performance. I thought, what are they laughing at? <laughs> and of course, when you do that soliloquy, everybody knows it, so they all join in anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an old song. <laughs> should, should lower, like, should lower a song sheet. <laughs> all together now. <laughs> uh, but I'm not used to too many titters. And by this time, I, I was feeling much better with the way things were going. And uh, I, I don't know, I did some fine gesture, and I, of course I was wearing my bloody glasses. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd been down below with the stagehands picking out winners. <laughs> and I just sort of trudged through as far as I could and thought, how do I get rid of these? And I was wearing horn rims, how do I get, <laughs> how do I get rid of these? And the only thing I could do was to sling them at Ophelia. <laughs> The same year, O'Toole found himself in the interview hot seat again. He had just finished filming the Don Quixote musical Man of La Mancha, but began this encounter with Sheridan Morley discussing The Ruling Class, a black comedy that would go on to earn him his fifth Oscar nomination. But what first attracted you to the idea of doing it? Uh, well, I read it, and... Uh, uh, I found it to be the, the, the funniest and uh, the most vital piece of work I'd encountered for a long, 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 long time. In fact, I, I remember reading it and trying to say um, what it was, you know, which category it came into. And I out Polonius, Polonius, you know, historical, comical, tragical, pastoral, hyperbolical, theological, and did about 25 suitable somersaults and finished up on my metaphysical bum, and <laughs> it was the ruling class, and, and I just thought it was, it, it was so savagely funny, and uh, lent itself so easily to uh, a film without being self-consciously filmic because of the fantasy in it, and uh, then I could get round me a group of, uh, you know, smashing Johnsonian actors, and do it, and we did it. In the old days, the executioner kept the common herd in order. When he stood on his gallows, you knew God was in his heaven, all right with the world. The punishment for blaspheming was to be broken on the wheel. First the fibula, crack. Then the tibia, patella, and femur, crack, crack, crack. Then the corpus, ulna, and radius, crack. Disconnect them bones then, dry bones, disconnect them bones then, dry bones, disconnect them bones then, dry bones. Now hear the word of the Lord. Well, your head bones connected to your neck bone, your neck bones connected to your shoulder bone, your shoulder bones connected to your back bone, your back bones connected to your hip bone, your hip bones connected to your thigh bone. Now hear the word of the Lord.
from the influence you had in the casting of it, once you got into the, the shooting, did you have an influence on, on the studio floor in the way it went? Oh, oh only in the, the normal way. Bullying and pleading and blackmailing and uh, kicking and hypocrisy and tears. and The normal things that one does in, in making a film <laughs> or a play, yes, yes. Turning then from the ruling class to your last completed but not yet released film, Man yes. of La Mancha, what led you into that? Uh, well, yes, well, uh, a desire to play Don Quixote, obviously, um, which I've always wanted to do. Uh, Peter Glenville and uh, a, a new book of the musical by John Hopkins. However, those ingredients were removed, I'm afraid, before I did the film. And uh, that's what led me into it. <laughs> it's, of course, your second musical, Counting Good by Mr. Chips, but can you, in fact, sing? I don't really think so. I mean, I could, I could wail some grievous ballad about some dying Mother McCree somewhere, you know, <laughs> which any Irishman can. <laughs> Just beyond my window, flowers every color of the rainbow. Red roses, orange marigolds, yellow buttercups, green leaves, blue cornflowers, indigo lilacs, and violets, violets. But in terms of films, one, one thinks of your career as starting with Lawrence, although, of course, there were films before that. Indeed there and, were. And yet somehow they disappeared in, in the great publicity for Lawrence, which... Yeah, yes, well, yes. Well, I, I think the idea was to, <laughs> to discover me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, they were very funny days, because... Uh, and I still don't know a great deal about what goes on, but I remember the first time I was on a film set, ever, and in theatre, as you remember, the producer was what is now called the director. Mm. And I didn't know which was a camera, or if the boom was a, a camera, or the fella twiddling the knobs was a cameraman, or the chap with the, the light meter was the camera. What? And I assumed that the man I'd been speaking to, who was the producer, was in fact the director. And I couldn't understand why this little fella kept on speaking to me <laughs> and telling me to do things, because I was listening to the other one. And I never knew what anything was. And I. Remember, I was, was Finchy, Peter Finch, he conned me into it because he said, there's only one man I know who can play the bagpipes, and that was me. And he wanted someone to do a scene with him playing the bagpipes. In what? A thing called Kidnapped, a Walt Disney thing. Finchy was playing the, the swashbuckler, and I was Rob Roy's McGregor's son. That's no very bad, Mr. Stewart, but you show a poor device in your warblers. Yeah, I'll give you the lie. Do you own yourself beaten at the pipes that you seek to change them for the sword? Well said, Mr. McGregor. So I'll appeal to Donald. You need appeal to no one, sir. For it's the God's truth, you're a creditable piper. For a steward. But were you still as innocent when it came to Lawrence? Yes, I was. And then I had the, the hardest master of them all, David Lean, uh, for two years. Uh, who is a hard bastard. By God, he is. But he knows his game absolutely backwards. One may disapprove of his subjects, or even his treatment of his subjects. But what he doesn't know about cinema is not worth knowing. And he would make me look through the lens. Look, look through here, Pete. This is a 75, and that's a 22, or whatever. And 
shot by shot by shot by shot, and even the cutting, yeah, I sat with him doing the cutting. You made, uh, well, two films in the 60s, which to me stand out far and away from the rest of your work, and in both of them you played the same character. I'm thinking... Henry II? Second. And Lion in Winter. Uh, are those the two that stick out in your mind also as being the best of the bunch? Well, oddly enough, I was speaking this morning to my wife, I was saying, look, I'm absolutely terrified. I don't know what to do or what to say on, 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 in television. I really just don't. And she said, well, if they ask you what your favourite thing is, you know, what will you say? And I said, well, I, go, I don't know. I should say Bristol and those happy three <laughs> years there. She said, no, no, no. Well, of course, it is Henry II. I mean, I, I could cheerfully, probably, and probably, I may even come to that, play Henry II for the rest of my life. I mean, I love him. And there's plenty of material. I mean, uh, uh, Irving died, didn't he? We were talking about that. And playing Beckett. There's mm. Tennyson's Beckett. There's a a play about Eleanor, there's uh, Christopher Fry's uh, uh, Kurt Mantle, the, and the, the Anui, and I could make a repertoire of about five or six plays of Henry II and just <laughs> flog them round forever, and then make films of them, or televisions or whatever, yes. Quite cheerfully, I could play. I, I adore playing Henry II. Outside of your working life, uh, as you say, one doesn't very often find you on uh, television programmes or... Uh, promoting pop records or selling yourself generally. Is that because you do really believe in, in a kind of privacy for an actor or...? Yes, I do. I, I feel that um, my job begins and ends with the curtain going up and coming down. Um, yes, that is so. But I am placed in this position and uh, off I go in my nice suit. Coming back then to... Uh your working life into the last film, Man of La Mancha. Are you entirely happy with the way it's turned out? Oh, how do I know? I mean, I, literally, I was, I was on a cart horse a few <laughs> days ago in Tarquinia, and, uh, uh, covered in bald heads and things. Peter O'Toole, the last question. Do you have any plans beyond Man of La Mancha? Yes, I do, to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> And if you've got any offers or suggestions, I'll, I'll take them up. I'll do that. Thank you. Peter O'Toole, thank you. Thank you. O'Toole was half true to his word. He didn't make another film for several years, focusing instead on the theatre, including a notorious production of Macbeth that was so savaged by the critics that audiences flocked to see if it was as bad as claimed. His comeback film, in contrast, was a critical triumph. The stuntman saw him playing a movie director, a performance he claimed he had based on David Lean. It won rave reviews and would lead to this appearance on the Russell Harty programme in 1980. Strange history about the stuntman, which you've made some years ago. Well, not that many years ago, but some years ago. You're looking well that. done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But the film's been made two or three years, four years? Uh, um, yes, three, uh, three years, three years. And now, all of a sudden, it's beginning to lift off the ground? Well, it didn't... Uh, it, it, it hasn't been released, it's escaped. And um, <laughs> uh, it is a, a brilliant work, as you've seen. I saw it. And uh, <laughs> deservedly yeah. It's a very dotty movie, Mr O'Toole, isn't it? It, it is a bit potty. Yeah, daft. And you're at the centre of it. Let's tell people what it's about as well. It's about a director. It's about um, a, a young fugitive on the run. Um, and he... Uh, w we know he's a very violent young man. Um, he does a deed of uh, appalling violence, is involved crossing a little bridge and sees a very funny old-fashioned car approaching him, assumes it's yet more... Um, terror in his life, aims a brick at it, succeeds. The car cheerfully pops over, there's a lot of bubbles, nothing left. Uh, he's in yet more shtuck. Um, and sees a helicopter... With you in it. With me in it, getting, and what, what is going on? And finally finds out that, in fact, it's part of a film. It was a stunt. And the deal is made that if the young man who is an escaped fugitive will take on the role of the stuntman who is dead at the bottom of the river. You will get him out of trouble. I will get him out of trouble if he will get me out of trouble, because I have three days in which to complete my film. Right. Well, now, let's look at the first bit, where you're on a wonderful kind of machine. You have a kind of a fairground machine that you sit on. What is it called? A crane. A crane. And you sit on this... <laughs> 
directing the movie and shouting orders at people, and here you are whizzing up on the crane. Good evening. Want to lift? Oh, Christy lie. Palm trees, yet more palm trees. Who had the audacity to put palm trees there? They will be in every shot. And what are palm trees doing waving around on a battlefield in Europe during the First World War? Answer me that. Nina, the actress so fair, who fancied a man with blonde hair. But Raymond discovers, as he lifts up the covers, that his double, young Lucky, is there. Now. Eli. Yes. It's gotten to the point. I have to check under the stopper in the bathtub when I take a shower to make sure I have some privacy. <laughs> Thank you, one and all, and good night. Step right up, folks. Ride the ride of the century on Eli's killer crane. Now that... Oh. I don't know whether you enjoyed it, did you? Because you seem to be giving a kind of flashy, outgoing performance throughout the whole movie. Well, it's a Mercutio role. It's, a, it's, it's, um, it's dashing, it's braggadocio. Certainly, I, I relished it. You said an interesting thing uh, just before we started the programme, that it is a pro uh, it's a film with peculiar grammar, its own grammar, its own syntax. Well, Richard is an... Uh, Richard Rush, the... Um, he calls it daft and he calls it all sorts of things, and all these things are accurate. It is all these... I'm, I'm being complimentary. It's, it, indeed. It's also a very, very good film. It's a brilliant film. Well, you were a stuntman yourself in long past. Well, before stunts were organised and went into a, a, a proper profession, yes. Mm. They would advertise for tall young men who could speak a word and ride a horse. Whatever, but these are the days of Ivanhoe and uh, uh, television uh, specials. Uh, You're in the Scarlet Pimpernel. Scarlet Pimpernel, that's right. What were you? A Scarlet or a Pimp or a I just I, I, <laughs> You're a writer. So I, I, I wrote and said, you have to, oh, I had a wonderful line in this. You have to make the acquaintance of Madame Guillotine. That was I your own spoke. And you rode your own camels in Lawrence and Arabia. Did, yes. did. One of the funny things was in the, in the days of, um, uh, as Bob Fitzsimmons and Simmons and co. will tell you, that when they would advertise for riders, invariably jockeys would turn up. So you'd find these wonderfully impressive chain mailed figures, and when they come up, they'll see back in exit. The comicals. So and about that high. Tiny. Yeah. Did, where did you learn to fight? Were you a rough kid? I mean, were you, did you have to put your fists up to help yourself in your youth? From time to time. Where was that? Hunslet. Near Leeds. Indeed. Rough area? Very. Did you ever uh, win fights or, or, or did you invariably lose them? <laughs> there was a body at the end and it was quite often hard. <laughs> were you prepared for the uh, torrents uh, of criticism that were thrown at your head after Macbeth? Um, no, I was not. Um, I was prepared to be criticised, yes, but not, 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 to, not to that extent. When did you realise that, that the whole thing had become a cause célèbre? Well, literally the following day. I mean, the house was besieged. The ticket, you mean the ticket office was besieged? No, my house, my Oh, own. your house, yes. yes. <laughs> and the ticket office at the same time. Lots of journalists jumping up and down. You were the sort of theatrical Lady Diana Spencer for that moment, weren't you? <laughs> Uh, yeah. But you were. Yes. You were, you, you, your time Flavour of the month. Right. And you say that reviews, today's reviews, are tomorrow's f fish and chip papers for wrapping six and penneth and two fish. And so you've clearly emerged from all that kind of situation. Um, we've emerged um, with a good, professional, very competent production, yes. The following decades brought more successes like the Last Emperor and My Favourite Year, a classic O2 performance that saw him nominate for the Best Actor Oscar for the seventh time. But he protested he was still in the game and had time to win one outright. That was a dream never fulfilled. But the 2006 film Venus did see him nominate for an amazing eighth time and prompted this career retrospective from Newsnight. Seven Oscar nominations and a towering reputation as a stage actor. Not bad, but think what Peter O'Toole could have achieved if he'd only persevered with his original profession, journalism. I was adopted by the feature department and the sports department. 
To write. To write and to, uh, to sniff out yarns. I was only a baby, I was only 16. But I would much rather be reported than report. I'd rather be on the field than among the spectators. That's how I've always been, as I have always felt. That's why I didn't think I fitted in very well to newspapers. I'd rather be the news. It had occurred to me as if I wanted to be a poet. And I, I Were you any good? No, hopeless. Really? Do, do, you, do you remember any of your couplets? Oh, I daren't even tell you. Later, perhaps. Yeah, yes. Yeah. What and appealed to you about that? Was it just writing poetry and oh, living that life and wandering around in a nice green cape, cape and and, and uh, like Mangan with a funny big hat on? And, and the ladies like poets. And the course. ladies adored poets. Yeah. So What's not to like? Indeed. Ah, yes, the ladies. I can't do it with anyone I know watching. You've got to be professional, my dear. Mr. Russell, if you don't mind. In his new film, O'Toole plays a mature actor, or at least an elderly one, in a winter-spring relationship with a wannabe model. Everything all right? There's a poignancy in seeing the 74-year-old O'Toole as a leading man, since he established himself so indelibly the first time he took that role. The extraordinary effect of being cast as Lawrence of Arabia in David Lean's epic was to make O'Toole a star, and somehow to keep him there despite more mixed fare thereafter. Always I'm wrong. Always. I woke up and found that was famous. It was great. It had bells on it. It was on toast. It was foaming at the bathtub. When writer Russell T. Davis revisited the legend of Casanova and the BBC were looking for someone to play the rake in old age, you'll never guess whose agent they rang. What's the burgomaster's daughter doing working in the kitchen? He died last year, sir. And there's not much provision for widows. And he had his debts. Gambling? Yes, sir. Good man! I know nothing at all about the women. Nothing. Not a sausage. But is it fair to say you've made a fairly thorough study? Done the best I can under the limited circumstances. Well, I think you're to be applauded for that. And what, what conclusions can you offer us? None. Really? Not a sausage. When you are beginning the business and you are in number seven dressing room at the Theatre Royal Bristol and you're looking at this face and you learn from a, a much older actor and you'll learn it early or you'll learn it never, that that you're looking at is the meat. It's got nothing to do with whether it's good looking or bad looking or big or little or whatever, nothing. That's what you work with. Venus would be O'Toole's final leading man role. In 2012, he released a statement announcing his retirement from acting, saying he bid the profession a dry-eyed and profoundly grateful farewell. When he died in 2013, aged 81, the eulogies spoke of him as one of cinema's last great hellraisers, a mesmerizing maverick and a true legend, on screen and off. Oscar-nominated performances for Peter O'Toole, John Gilgood and Richard Burton in Beckett next on BBC Two.